All right, let's get started. It seems that uh, we've got just about everybody who's going to, to join. Um, so the agenda for today uh, has three items on it. First of all, uh, we're going to have John O'Hara from the Transmart Foundation giving us an update on the development roadmap leading out through 2016 and into the first half of 2017. Um, this is something that we've been working on since the annual meeting, especially, and putting more precision around it. So John's going to give us a, a walkthrough of uh, where we stand with that. Um, the second item is Ter <clears throat> Terry Weymouth is going to give us a quick update on uh, the improved installation process that we've been working on. We've made a lot of progress on that. And thirdly, uh, we have Mariska Birkins from uh, the Trait Project, and she's going to present on some on oncology use cases. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn this over and unmute uh, John. John, can you hear me? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Keith. And I'll just uh, run the uh, run the slides from here, if that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Can can you see them? I can. So if you'll okay. start us into the uh, first slide after the title. Okay. Great. You might want to run that full uh, screen. Can full screen. Uh, this is just a PDF, so I think I think this is what we've got. Okay, fantastic. So the the very first slide, uh, you know, I think for for people who are relatively new to TransMart, if there are, are any of those on the call, uh, just describes the various uh, you know functional areas. There are areas for search and uh, and browse on the data sets. There are analysis and visualization tools. Those are on the top, and then there are various interfaces uh, to the data. Um, and, and data loading tools on the bottom. This gives a, a fairly good picture. If you'll move into the next slide, though, this really talks to um, uh, the implementation priorities that we have. So, you know, following uh, my presentation, we're going to get a you know really good presentation or discussion from Terry Weymouth, who's going to talk about uh, our steps forward in the installation process. We've gotten some very consistent feedback that the installation process with respect to installing TransSmart and the affiliated components is, uh, you know, daunting. And we'd like to make that as easy as possible. But to that end, we're going to do uh, two uh, installation activities. One is around a basic Ubuntu install with a clean Ubuntu installation. And that install script is one that you can heavily modify for your own uses uh, in production environments, fit into any DevOps uh, platform that you have, and, and use as the basis for your work. Uh, we will ultimately do this uh, for other platforms as well, but we're starting out with Ubuntu and uh, Postgres, and I'm sure we'll move on to Red Hat and uh, Oracle in a, in a next phase, but right now, uh, the target is to make it very, very easy, almost a, a single or single few command line installs for, for Ubuntu and Postgres. That is making good progress. Terry will talk about that. The other is to create a virtual uh, machine environment so that if you have a VMware or, uh, or, uh, or Zen environment, you'll be able to load the Transmart platform on that. We'll support three or four uh, VMware, certainly, uh, the Oracle uh, VirtualBox environment, which we've been supporting, and, and a Zen environment as well. So getting a, a reliable install process is, is key. Second, uh, we're going to do quite a bit of work to make sure that our build process incorporates this install and on a nightly basis that we're doing uh, a basic amount of functional testing on the installed uh, release artifacts to make sure that they are running so that what gets checked in on the tip levels of the source code are also making good progress. This is all part of uh, improving our development activities, our improving our code governance, uh, you know, basically making sure that everything that gets checked in and, and, uh, and run gets some level of, of automated review 
and uh, peer review, and um, and so so you're going to see a lot of focus on build, uh, install, automated testing, et cetera, and doing this in a transparent way. In addition, it's also important uh, for our priorities that it not just be an easy to install the software, but also to load data sets and to begin being productive with the tool in the way that it's designed. And so we're going to be working with uh, our, our uh, software for 1.3 and for 2.0, um, which we've renamed uh, to, to be time-centric in uh, in 16.2 and 17.1, um, but 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 the focus there will be make sure that the uh, ETL process is simpler and much easier to get a large amount of data, um, you know, assigned. And you'll see some announcements out of us as as uh, as more data sets are available. We've got some exciting news that we're going to be announcing shortly about a vastly expanded number of data sets available. And then last, one of the key focuses is uh, around re-engineering the product to improve our scalability. So for instance, some areas where we need to make some enhancements are in the area of genomic data. Uh, the genomic data today is loaded in, in VCF files into our relational database. We need to have support for a lighter weight database uh, backend so that, that very, very large volumes of genomic data can be loaded in and searched and visualized uh, very efficiently. Those steps will take place in the, what we call the, the, the 17.1 or, or, or as it was called before, the 2.0 timeframe, which is in the first half of 2017, uh, hence the, the 17.1. Additionally, so that we can support uh, private or pseudo-private data sets, we're going to be putting in support for database federations so that there will be some authentication authorization. Keith, if you'd move to the next slide, I'd like to just talk to scheduling. So as you can see here, uh, we've renamed the releases. So 16.1 is what we call our 1.2.5 release, which is coming out in the first half of 2016. Uh, that release is essentially going to pick up bug fixes and uh, some minor changes and uh, and be out. Uh, there will be one big change in 16.1, which Terry may talk about, which is that we will digitally sign the uh, release artifacts with a PGP key, and that those digital signed artifact digitally signed artifacts uh, will be easily verifiable as an official Transmart Foundation release. 16.2, which is what we are now calling our, our, our 1.3 release, will incorporate some new features. Uh, Keith Nagel is working with the community now to define what those features will be, but for example, things like Smart R are certainly candidates. 17.1 uh, is going to be the first release, uh, first half of 17, uh, and is going to be focused at a long-term support release, which will incorporate uh, functionality enhancements in a number of areas, the load, data loading process, the uh, federation that we talked about, the performance of genomic data uh, are all key focuses, and I think everyone knows that our, our plan of record is to incorporate uh, I2B2 support back into the release. Uh, still a little bit too early to talk about the 17.2 release, so I'll, I'll leave that, but this release roadmap kind of shows you where we are today with the various uh, releases. If you'd be so kind, Keith, uh, as to move to the next slide. This talk, talks a little bit about what we just said in one slide. If there's one slide in this presentation you know, to, to look at and to understand, I think it's this one. 16.2, uh, we've talked about, uh, focused on uh, being the first release that comes out with a full uh, set of code governance and uh, development um, programs around it, automated build, test, and install, uh, automated static code inspection using tools like Coverity. If you're familiar with Coverity, it's a great way to, to go through your code and uh, make sure that, that uh, you know, it's very solidly in place. Think of it as a, a lint on steroids, if you will. Uh, restructuring of some uh, you know, ETL capabilities so that you can load data sets very easily and in a batch fashion. 
and, uh, and Smart R's visualization. The other big project to talk about here is obviously the 2.0 or 17.1 project as we're now calling it. We talked about I2B2 reintegration. Uh, you know, that is in active planning right now. Uh, enhanced genomic support for, for uh, large amounts of genomic data. And again, we're working there uh, to define that. We believe that it will necessitate a uh, non-SQL database backend like HBase, although uh, we haven't definitively chosen that database yet. And uh, federation, and 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 frankly, you know, federation probably sort of last because we're still working out the use cases on federation. And if any members of the community would like to give us what they view as their use cases for federation and access to either private or semi-private data between cooperating entities, we would be extremely uh, grateful for that. And then I'll just throw out one comment about uh, seventeen point two. We will have some level of genomic data support enhanced for 17.1, I feel fairly confident. But 17.2, it's going to be important to have very, very uh, robust support for high dimensional data to support oncology applications beyond just what is um, you know, available. So we're, we're, we're looking for community input into what we would do to support genomic data for oncology and neuroscience applications in that release. So please get back to Keith Nagel or certainly reach out to any member of the community, um, you know, and, and especially the Transmart Foundation team members to let us know your thoughts on that. We would really appreciate it. Keith, if you'd move to the, the next slide, please. We talked about, uh, you know, doing the install process, uh, you know, part of the code governance and standards and practices improvements are having a limited number of certified code committers. Uh, these are people who will be shepherding the code into the uh, GitHub uh, repositories and, uh, you know, basically making sure for us that what goes in make, makes sense and, and meets standards. To support them, we'll also have both automated and hand testing uh, scripts set up. These will be based on both regular base level builds and nightly builds to check code that's been inserted. We'll have uh, both sample data sets and live data sets to do appropriate testing. Additionally, we'll require that, that testing and documentation uh, frameworks be available for all supported code and uh, you know as we go forward that will be an important thing for the code committers to see before they go forward with with submissions and then lastly we want to make sure that our intellectual property rights and yours are all protected adequately and so we're going to be working uh, to make sure that all of them come with the appropriate licenses granted by the authors of the code and that these make sense and harmonize with overall Transmart IPR policy. So Keith, if you'll just move to our summary slide, that'd be great. So our, our goal for the next 12 months is really to bring the product from what can honestly be called an academic uh, and research grade to a commercial grade offering a la Apache uh, Spark or uh, Apache Tomcat and really you know, get this to a point where your businesses and research institutions and universities can come to depend on it every single day. We want to extend and build out the APIs, not just the ones that exist now, but new ones so that you can add on visualization engines or backends, database backends like or genomic data or oncology data, critical, critical to extending the platform. We want to work with teams um, to, that have these visualization or database backends to incorporate their work with ours. And so we're going to be reaching out to these organizations, people like CBioPortal, amongst others, to, to, you know, to, to get interfaces between our two products. And really to make sure that we coordinate a path with you so that, you know, as a community, we can move this technology forward together. Uh, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to me personally or to any other member of our community teams 
and uh, we want to work very proactively with you on this. If there are any questions, uh, you know, we'll, we'll transparently answer all of them to the best of our abilities. So I'm going to turn this back to Keith Nagel and Terry Weymouth, who's going to tell you about our uh, activities on the uh, uh, dedicated install front. Thank you very much, Keith. Thanks, John. Um, are there any questions uh, right now? We, we could take a few minutes here if, uh, if anybody has any particular questions. Um, it's important to keep an eye on this nomenclature. I know this is a new, uh, a new nomenclature that we're rolling out. So, um, but I think it makes a lot more sense and maps much more transparently to, uh, to the development process that we're putting in place. So, you know, keep an eye on that and, and you'll, you'll get used to it. Um, all right. Well, I don't see anybody uh, raising. Oh, sorry, Dirk. Let me unmute you. Okay, Dirk Bornmeyer. Hi, this is Dirk. Um, I was at the annual meeting, and one idea that was floated or discussed was the idea of forking the code into a research fork and an enterprise fork. Does this roadmap essentially uh, announce that 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 plan was not? you know, is not the one that's going to go forward? We are going to be, um, we are going to be focusing on one code base going forward, which will be uh, basically moving towards a production product. Uh, there will be other code bases, I'm sure, with other organizations that, uh, that might have a more research flavor to it. And we would be we would welcome the incorporation of any of those capabilities, you know, into the the enterprise focused code. Uh, but for us, it's really one code base that migrates over time. And uh, yes, you're you're correct. We're we're really focusing on one code base. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Terry. Uh, Terry, let me. I can unmute you. Oh, no, I can't. Uh, Terry, are you on the phone? I don't seem to be able to unmute you. There we go. Oh, there we go, Terry. All right, all right. Sorry about that. I forgot to put in my uh, call code. Um, actually, I'm going to open up with a comment on the last question. Um, I think we need to make a distinction between Transmart Foundation and Transmart Community. The Transmart Foundation is concerned with capturing the best of Transmart and producing a commercial grade product. The Transmart community, a large part of it, is concerned with the exploration of new ideas. And we are maintaining two separate GitHub repositories. The, the current Transmart GitHub repository will continue to be a place for the development of new ideas, for research into code, uh, for development of branches that reflect that research. Um, and um, I think that that's what was discussed at the um, community meeting. The other repository is called Transmart Foundation, which is, a, which is actually a fork of the Transmart project in GitHub. But it's a fork that we're maintaining a much tighter control over so that we can assure the quality of the code that goes into it. And I believe that's what was called the enterprise version in the context of the community meeting. Um, let me go. Did you, did you have a slide? Uh, I did. I'm trying to get back to, I'm trying to close this document. Uh, <laughs> PDF. All right, I'll, I'll start talking while you're doing that. Well, yeah, I'll find that. So specifically, on the um, the process for creating a release method, um, I have uh, taken the the historical pieces of release process and assembled them all together in one 
in one place, the, the sort of the best and the greatest of what other people have done. Much of the work developed um, originally at the Hive and subsequently contributed to by people at Imperial, the Hive, and other people as well. We have a fairly complete um, set of make files and customized uh, scripts, um, and of course the uh, data loading based on Kettle. We have a fairly complete set of autom set, uh, automated steps. And what we're trying to do is assemble those automated steps into a single process. And um, there's a actually, uh, Keith, if you could just bring up the wiki page with the um, install steps on it, that if you're having trouble getting. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just up. getting I'm just getting this uh, this presentation back. Sorry about that, everyone. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll just. Uh, So there's a there is a wiki page which um, on the new wiki site which articulates those those steps and um, I'm kind of waiting here for I'm Keith sorry. to come forward. Um, yeah. All right, sorry, I got the slides back. Okay, I'm talking about the wiki page yeah. now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> installation process. Okay, let me not lose that yeah. one. Okay. All right. Well, yes. yeah, that's all right. Um, and so that that wiki page would would allow somebody to um, to view all the steps, to go through those steps one by one, um, and we've tested that uh, a number of times. And it will result in a a complete install of Transmart with some example data in it. As I said, once we identified those key steps, and that was mostly a process of extracting information from um, the previous sources that were made available by, um, as I said, people like the Hive and others. Uh, once we assemble those steps, we're now deep in the process of trying to create an all-in-one script. Um, that all-in-one script then will uh, enable users to scroll to the table of contents. There we go. So you can see here, it, just leave it on the table of contents. I'll talk to that. Okay. That's fine. You, you can see here, so this, the wiki page is in the new, um, uh, Transmart Wiki, it's under Install Transmart. It's called Installing the Current Official Release. And it's broken into two parts. There's a set of all in, uh, a set of instructions that refer to the all in one script and a set of instructions following from the fourth item here that refer to the steps that that script will execute and gives you step by step instructions for executing them. The step-by-step -step instructions are very valuable for people who want to modify the install process for their particular institution or uh, set up people who want to extend this install process to other uh, other machines. As, as John said, we're currently uh, debugging this install process on a clean Ubuntu machine, and then once we get that in hand, we will branch out from there. The third item, all-in-one instructions, refers to an all-in-one script where you type a, a three setup command lines and then you type a command that says run the script that does the install. Um, we have that running. It's not running well. Um, there's quite a bit of debugging information that we need to collect and get it uh, get it going so that it really works uh, robustly. Um, and that's what I'm working on now. I think I've covered everything, Keith. OK. Uh, let me go back to the slides then. Yeah. All right. Um, 
If anyone uh, you know wants to uh, send us information about the platforms that they are uh, most interested in, um, it would be useful to know what other platforms we need to focus on after Ubuntu. Um, so that sort of information would be useful. Um, all right. Um, so next up, we have uh, Mariska from Trey, and I'm going to find her and unmute her. Okay, Mariska. Well, uh, hi. Good day. Hello. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, so. Uh, I'd like to tell you about a use case that we have in Trade, which is actually three use cases uh, combined into one. A molecular viewing and data analysis integration use case. Uh, if you would please go to the next slide. So in Trade, we have uh, various use cases that we would like to see being worked out so that we can perform multiple types of query and analysis as well as visualizations of translational research data. And the study on which the use cases are based basically share the same design. Uh, and available data per study may be either clinical data, biomedical imaging, biosample data, and molecular experimental data. And uh, we have several solutions to sustainably manage these data, data types separately. Uh, but in trade, the processed data for all these domains will become available in Transmacht. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in Transmart, here are some analysis and visualizations already possible. So Transmart functionality has been extended over the last couple of years through uh, some of the trade use cases, uh, resulting in, for example, specific array CGH analysis and visualizations, as well as the BioPortal's OncoPrint, uh, renamed GenePrint here, being made possible. However, there are still queries that researchers want to ask of the data in Transmart, but to fully realize this, Transmart functionality would need to be extended further uh, to, to fully please the researcher, basically. Uh, and also to be able to uh, filter your high dimensional data. Next slide, please. So we have different use cases which share some general requests. And what I'd like to focus on during this presentation uh, is uh, Molvika for short. It's a use case about two different studies and demonstrates how users would want to query their different types of data once this data has been made available through, for example, Transmart. So the focus of this use case involves the RCGH or copy number data derived from study one, uh, but also the RNA-seq data, then think of uh, differential expression, uh, fusion genes or small nucleotide variants genes of study two, which is a completely different study. Next slide, please. Uh, so just some little background. Study one is a study about colorectal cancer. There's uh, clinical data. There's molecular experimental data, such as non-omics, which uh, gets stored into Transmacht as uh, low dimensional data. And then uh, there's also the omics data, comparative genomic hybridization, microarray, or RCGH, uh, on which we want to be able to perform queries in Transmart. Next slide, please. So I don't know how well you know RCGH, but what's important to know is that DNA derived from tumor is compared to DNA from a normal reference. And then after processing and analysis, you get DNA, DNA profiles for each sample or subject. So shown in this slide, you can see two such DNA profiles with chromosome 1 to up to X being plotted on the X axis and the ratio of tumor versus normal plotted on the Y axis. Each dot that you see is a data point for a microarray probe. And basically, if they are at the zero line here, it means that there are no chromosomal aberrations detected. The sample has normal amount of DNA copies. And in the figure below, however, you can see that there are chromosomal aberrations present with uh, an increase of genetic material for, for instance, chromosome uh, 1Q or 7 uh, being a gain, but also decreases of genetic material, uh, for instance, chromosome 1P or 8P, which is a loss. Uh, so the lower sample has an abnormal amount of DNA copies for certain chromosomal regions. 
And this is something of interest to the researcher. We want to be able in Transmark to search for a particular aberration or select against such aberrations. Next slide, please. So the original aim of study one was to investigate a possible relation between chromosomal aberrations in colorectal cancer patients with metastasis and response to treatment. So frequency plots showing chromosomal aberrations were made of selected groups and survival tests were performed for uh, RACGH regions. In order to work towards sustainable data solutions, the involved data has been imported to Transmart and one of the first things that we wanted to be able to do was reproduce the results of the study. Uh, thus we wanted to be able to question the data for which chromosomal regions are associated with a better or worse survival in patients within a certain treatment arm. And during this process we discovered that we really needed to model the data uh, in Transmart in a certain manner in order to be, uh, be able to select the groups uh, in the beginning. To, uh, so in, in this case we needed to create some extra nodes uh, for, for, for the more uh, specified selection criteria like uh, think of the and if but then or not uh, type of situations whereas Transmart currently can do the and or. Uh, so and uh, furthermore we also wanted to know whether uh, was there a significant difference in chromosomal aberration pattern between two groups uh, with clinical variable, for instance, something microsatellite stable versus microsatellite instable uh, tumors. Uh, and, well, thus new analysis were built into Transmart and it was tested and confirmed that the published results could be reproduced. Uh, so a big part of the initial use case was solved already through this though further queries and visualizations are still desired, actually. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, then there is study two, which is a study about prostate cancer and has its own uh, use case. So uh, it has slightly different data types uh, that are intended to go to Transmart. So again, uh, there's clinical data. In this case, there's biosample data available. And in this case, there is omics data available, in particular next generation sequencing. And then for this use case, the emphasis lies on the RNA-seq results. Uh, but there is also, to lesser extent, uh, DNA-seq exome sequencing and the SNP array data. Next, please. So from the researchers and bioinformatician side, the involved people aim to provide translational research scientists with simple but accurate analytical applications in order to determine somatic variation in tumor samples. And this is something that they did deliver outside of Transmart. Uh, for instance, pipelines for the processing of both DNA-seq and RNA-seq data that can be initiated from Galaxy. And in Galaxy also there are some uh, functionalities to get this analyzed data visualized. Uh, think, for instance, on the circles plots that you see on the right. And there is also uh, iFuse 2 in Galaxy with which you can see a visualization of what does a fusion gene look like, which chromosomes and which genes does it actually involve. Uh, so that's uh, in Galaxy. Uh, next, please. So these are the studies that were selected for Molvika. And uh, goals of this use case are actually to enable data querying, both standard and complicated, of molecular data available in Transmart, and also to enable data viewing of molecular data in combination with clinical data or other molecular data. Uh, so either in Transmart or through Transmart, and finding the pipelines uh, back in the experimental domain. So this querying and viewing is something we would like to do within a study, uh, but also uh, across studies would be really nice. And uh, please note that items relevant for data querying are also relevant for when aiming to generate data subsets from Transmart. And there are different manners in which similar things can be queried on both the same data 
but also different data types. Uh, so, so how do you handle with that? Uh, well, how do you handle that? Next slide, please. Uh, going back to the main experimental data types of these studies, uh, there is the RECGH data of which we can obtain in Transmart DNA copy number alteration status, uh, losses, gains, amplifications, and also present in the data file, but something that cannot be queried for right now, are segments uh, in the data uh, which indicate breakpoints. Uh, then for study two, the RNA-seq data will give you differential gene expression, which is a measure of RNA expression, and uh, single or small nucleotide variants, and not shown on this slide, uh, but also of interest, fusion genes detected with this platform. Next, please. So once data from these two studies is available in Transmart, we want to be able to perform several types of queries on the data, and I'd like to first uh, start with simple queries. Next, please. Uh, so now I'm going to just uh, tell you some examples of what do we want, basically. Uh, so uh, performing a single gene query, I want to examine the alteration status of that single gene and see some summary data in Transmart. For example, with what frequency does an alteration of the queried gene occur? Uh, show me the numbers, the frequencies for each type of alteration. If I query for a gene, show me uh, DNA copy number status. Show me altered expression. Is a gene up or uh, under expressed compared to a normal reference? And that is a query that I would like to perform on one study, multiple studies, a subset of one study, or different subsets within either the same or different studies to make it even more complicated. Uh, so, so, that, so that you can just intuitively select your groups on the fly and see these little bars, uh, for instance, on the right, which are summarized data. Uh, so, so some of you might recognize uh, the figure on the right, uh, as it is also, it is a C-BioPortal example, actually. And this one, is a uh, C-BioPortal, is already capable of uh, telling you the summarized statistics of this. Uh, okay. Well, from uh, examining the alteration status of a single gene, we like Transmart being able to select for a certain alteration criteria. Uh, for example, from one or more colorectal cancer study, give me all the data of patients that have an increase in DNA copy number for the gene ARCA and increased mRNA expression of this gene. And from here on, users want to uh, examine the data further of their newly selected cohort. Uh, next, please. Uh, so from the study level, we want to be able to zoom in to subject or sample level and ask the question, which are exactly the samples in particular that are affected by an alteration for that single gene? Uh, and, and what type of alteration occurred then for those samples, which have DNA or RNA alteration? So in our trade instance, uh, the code of CBioPortal's Oncoprint was adopted and renamed the GenePrint. And this now allows for a quick integrative view, uh, as you're familiar with in the CBioPortal. Uh, a caveat there, however, is that you need to supply the data at gene level. And uh, well, we say that the user, the, the data owner, has to supply the gene level data. but uh, it, it's not that easy for all the users, basically, so we want to help them. Uh, but this is a really nice uh, integrative viewing uh, for the subject level uh, already. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, study or subset comparisons after performing a single gene query are also desired. So based on specific selection criteria, we want to not only see the presence of alterations of different molecular levels, but we'd like to determine whether there are significant differences in the prevalence of an alteration for the query gene. So starting at a study level for now, I want to perform comparisons based on data of those patients that have an increase in DNA copy number gain for the gene ARCA and increased mRNA expression for these genes, and compare it to patients who are DNA copy number normal 
and have no altered mRNA expression for this gene. And after I've made this subselection, I then like to drag clinical, non amical or either uh, or also amical data into the summary tab uh, to explore further like what 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 looks interesting, what is nice to what, what is different between these two uh, subsets that I just made. Next, please. So we'd not like uh, only like to be able to query single genes, but multiple genes. Uh, in which case, the previously mentioned queries remain the same. And now, in addition, we also want to see and or combinations of different genes. Is there a significant difference in the prevalence of an alteration in any one of the query genes between different study or disease groups? And as you can see here with the subsetting query, we really want to compare and, uh, a really specific cohort. For example, uh, show me samples that have DNA copy number gain for ARCA and or TPX2, and also an increased mRNA expression for these genes. And I want to compare that then to a cohort in which these patients have no alterations for ARCA and or TPX2. And uh, then again, once you've made the subset selection, you want to be able to perform survival analysis on those particular criteria. So you don't want to leave them in a subset comparison tab. You actually want to be able to drag them into the survival analysis that Transmart has already. Uh, next, please. And then there's also the desire to query data in Transmart based on chromosomal locations. Like one of my colleagues always likes to say, I want to have all the data for samples with a 20Q gain. And this then actually raises good questions about how do you define 20Q gain? How does Transmart know from high dimensional data types which samples all have a 20Q gain? Uh, what exactly will be possible to query for? Do you need to supply exact locations from chromosome base bar start to end, or can you do it with cytobands? How, how flexible is the system? And can this question be asked of different data types uh, and which correct results are being retrieved? So for instance, RSCGH data may be present as gene, region, or perhaps even probe level. So how do you ask, give me the samples of 20Q gain if I only have one of those, for example? Uh, so enabling users to ask this question requires some work on Transmart, but likely also on data formats that need to be supplied to, uh, to Transmart and uh, corresponding metadata as well. So once it is possible to make such a selection, 20Q gain, uh, its use could then be extended so that users can ask uh, which subsets or studies have, for, have a 20Q gain in more than 30% of their samples and even further extended to give me a subset with 20Q gain in more than 30% of the samples versus uh, less than 30% of the samples, making your uh, own subset again to explore the data further. Next, please. So that were for us pretty generic questions that we want to ask of translational uh, research data in order to either examine just one subset adhering to some selection criteria or to make different subsets. So now onto questions that are more specific to the actual molecular viewing and analysis use case. Next slide, please. So in study two, fusion gene candidates were detected using platform RNA-seq. And a question that we'd like to see answered is, can breakpoints of reported fusion genes be detected at DNA level in the DNA sec results of the same samples of that study. So first, we would like to see a correlation of alterations within or around genes between two different kind of platforms, DNA sec versus RNA sec. And a correlation or recognition of chromosomal location or genes across data analyzed uh, with different genomic builds, uh, HG18 versus HG19, uh, like. Uh, this is actually an issue because uh, the RNA-seq data was done on HD19 and showed some interesting small nucleotide variants. And if you downgrade to HD18, the entire chromosomal region is not present in the genomic build. So how do you perform good enough matching? Uh, or do you just say, okay, no, we don't allow the matching. We need to uh, give a heads up like you can't compare this type of data. Uh, but if the data 
basically users will want to have a look at it like, oh, what does my DNA expression, does it uh, correspond to the RNA expression or do my small nucleotide variants detected with DNA level also uh, match the ones on RNA level. Right now, however, we even have an issue on getting fusion gene data into Transmart. Uh, Monday I heard there was a model to get data in there, but once the fusion uh, gene data is in, you couldn't do anything with it anymore because uh, it is two region data, so you can't look at it on a genome browser. You could export it, but there are also no analysis right now in Transmart that could handle the data. So basically, new functionality would have to be built into Transmart just to be able to view it. Next slide, please. Uh, putting a similar question to data from both study one and study two. So of the study two reported fusion genes, can breakpoints at DNA level be detected in any of the samples, and if so, which? From study one, which is a completely different study, and also done with RSCGH, which is a lower resolution platform. So it seems you need to be able to query for alterations within or around genes again. Uh, preferentially, a list of genes uh, would be preferred that you don't have to query each gene that you're interested in. Uh, between RSCGH, which is usually region level data, and RNA-seq, which is handed over either as gene level data or as fusion gene level data. Uh, so you need to be able to correlate these alterations between uh, different data types, DNA copy numbers, segments, uh, versus RNA expression, altered expression uh, compared to normal reference. And it's necessary that you perform correlation recognition of uh, the HG18 versus the HG19 builds again. So the same issues as uh, previously mentioned, actually. So for now, such questions actually need to be answered outside of Transmart. For study one in particular, the region level data is stored in Transmart. It contains log two ratios for a region, along with segmented values and called values. The data is in Transmart, but in order to query for the segments, the breakpoints, uh, you would need to go outside to tools such as Chipster or even Galaxy. Uh, and, and then you would need to rerun some processing pipeline and then somehow achieve integration of the results that are uh, in Transmart. Uh, and also, if the calling has been too rigid, uh, like you smoothed out too much, or you just want to rerun your pipeline because the segments are too large uh, uh, for the breakpoints, thinking now also of other studies, uh, you want to go back to probe level data. So you will actually want to go to the raw data, pre-process it again, and then integrate the newly generated breakpoints to the fusion genes that were detected in the study too. Uh, but how will you get the data temporarily back into Transmart to continue with the querying is also then uh, an, an, an issue. Next slide, please. So is the manner in which you want to compare uh, Okay, so, so this is basically the, the, the opposite use case. Uh, so if you have study one uh, done with uh, comparative genomic hybridization array and you have your breakpoints data and this is what you enter into Transmart now, uh, you want to go into another study, you want to go to the study two and ask like, okay, of my reported breakpoints, do I see breakpoints at DNA-sec level or do I see fusion genes at RNA-sec level data? So again, the exact same issues uh, apply here. Uh, so now you want to perhaps tweak around with the RNA-sec or the DNA-sec uh, data. Uh, so a question that is related to this is like, I want to compare overall survival of patients uh, in colorectal cancer versus prostate cancer samples, but only if these samples have a breakpoint in another gene. Uh, so, so that's basically one of the ideas behind that. Okay, uh, last, uh, last slide, please. So lastly, for this meeting, uh, we want to be able to use public databases as reference sources. Uh, so of interesting fusion genes, study two, 
or breakpoints in study one. Can you detect breakpoints at DNA level from databases in, uh, from uh, public reference databases? What do public databases such as uh, the list shown below tell you actually about the queried gene or the fusion gene? Are there other alterations widely associated with an alteration in this gene? Uh, and what I know that SmartR is capable of doing, we want to link out. Uh, if you're in a heat map or you're in a uh, or, or in other high omics uh, data, we want to be able to click on a gene or an item of interest and then be directed out of Transmart for more information, uh, such as, for example, indeed uh, the gene cards. So that's basically a summary, and it might have been really fast, uh, of some of the research questions that we have in this use case. Uh, so if you have questions and I can elucidate some manners, feel free to ask. Um, hereby, Keith, okay. I give the word back to you. All right. Thank you, Mariska. That was very good. Um, I'm just watching. Anybody that has a question can either type it in or raise your hand, and I'll unmute you to ask it. Um, in the meantime, though, since we're looking at this slide, I'm curious, Mariska, I mean, have you guys done any work to curate uh, any of these public data sources for Transmart, or are you aware of anybody who has? Uh, well, not curation. Like, I know from uh, study one, which this is actually the decode study, which uh, can be named, uh, one of the users used the TCDA uh, study, and uh, basically the format was already correct, so the TCGA data, a part of it, was put into Transmart. But to have the entire study publicly available, uh, no, that's not the case. Yeah. It would be really nice, however, if the public, uh, the public data sets are actually in the folder public, for instance, of Transmart, right. and that you can do the across study querying. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's something for our content uh, efforts to take up. Um, okay. Um, again, any questions out there? I'm not seeing any hands raised, uh, nor Keith, any... Keith, I can't, I can't raise a hand, but I think I can talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, talk away. You're on. As an organizer, I can't raise a hand, so um, thank oh, you, Mariska. That was a great presentation. Oh, thank I've got you. A quick question. I've got a quick question. Mm -hmm. Looking through a number of the questions you were asking, it, it's clear that there is an understood vocabulary for some of these things. You, you talked about like a 20p um, translocation, I think it was, and a few other other types of events. Mm -hmm. Is is it possible to take something like Cosmic that defines these, or another database that defines these, and simply annotate all of your data when you're loading it in through the ETL process, so that you can ans ask these questions interactively? Uh, so, so the interactively would be really nice, and the 20Q is just an entire chromosome arm, right. and uh, it, it might be that just one tiny part of 20Q is gained, or a bigger part, and the cosmic database doesn't contain all this information, but uh, I think that a, a library uh, understanding needs to be built into Transmart, that you know, like, if you have something on genomic build 19, and... Uh, Transmart needs to be able to recognize chromosome position this and this equals 20Q. Uh, and if I have just a subpart of that, it can also fit into the query because the user will be able to filter out, like, oh, but that's not the region that I was actually interested in. But you do get all your 20Q regions back, if that makes sense. <coughs> well, it would seem that if you're in the ETL process, that one could take the data and much like, like, um, CBAR portal does taking the, the firehose data from Broad is that you could run a workflow against that to annotate you know specific sets of mutations that you would expect to see in a particular tumor base. You know, for like for example, if you're looking at multiple myeloma, there are you know several key translocations that are, are you know common in myeloma, and you could do that kind of a workflow analysis and simply populate the tables. Uh, yeah, and this is then something that would need to be done for every high well every omics data type. Right. And as long as you're then able to ask of any data type that you annotate one time, then it's just the press of a button. Uh, that that's then really fine. Uh, but it needs to come from both ends. Like it needs to be built into Transmart. You need to upgrade uh, or update your ETL pipelines, and then let the data supplier know. Okay, this is what we want from you. And if they can't supply it, then it needs to be offered. In our case, as a 
oh, we will do it for you. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've talked about in the roadmap, which um, uh, John you know, went through with you, is in the context of the 17.2 project, what we see as a release in the second half of 17, I could see you know, some very specific enhancements to Transmart that are disease specific, particularly for cancer. And I think these are a great set of use cases to draw from and to think about ways to solve those kinds of problems. So anyway, thanks for the presentation. It was excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, that uh, takes us right about to time. So um, with that, I think I will uh, end the webinar and uh, wish everyone a, a wonderful holiday. And we will see you in the new year. Happy Enjoy. holidays, everyone. Thanks. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.